The person I'll be talking to today is actually the inspiration behind this podcast. And she was one of the reasons why we started this podcast in the first place. So I was like one of those short girls, mm -hmm. um, chubby. I mean, you're still short. <laughs> no offense, though. <laughs> But I'm not that short right yeah. now. Um, and I was kind of like chubby. I couldn't even run. Uh -huh. But I was athletic. This girl knows how to karate, how to taekwondo. <laughs> like because there was literally bomb. You know? You learned English grammar for two straight years. You know, five languages, right? You said you counted Uzbek, Tajik, Russian, English, and... Turkish. You know Turkish. Yes. But what's your level on Turkish? I think it's either A2 or B1. Mm -hmm. A conversational level Turkish, yes. right? And how did you learn Turkish? If you were to go and ask school girls right now, or high school girls, what are you going to do in the future? I bet nine out of ten of them would say, I want to learn English. Like, like switching languages can be, for you it sounds like a walk in the park, but with me though, it's, 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 it's not easy. It's not, especially when I'm speaking Tajik and Uzbek, I feel so out of place. If we pay attention to a lot of jobs that mm -hmm. require communication skills, like women work there more, right? I all the time doubted myself. I never like believed what I could do, like never. Mm -hmm. And when you offered me a job, I was in awe. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. Mm -hmm. And when I started like working here, the atmosphere, the environment was and still is amazing. Did you feel more satisfied when you got your eight than when you got your 8.5? And, and I was actually told this by students literally a few times they would text me. And sometimes come to me crying and say, teacher, you should not be doing this. Uh, it will, it hurts us a lot. And I didn't realize at the time because I lacked teaching competence, mm -hmm. right? Now, if it weren't for those students who opened up about the, how they felt, about the way I treat other students, about the fact that I compared them, I would have never learned my lessons and I'd be no different from those teachers who used to work with. What would you do if you were me for a day? Wow. Yeah. You have to sacrifice something if you want to get something. Mm -hmm. Hey folks, hey everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adustria Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Today, I'm going to be talking to an amazing guest. I... I don't honestly know how to put it. So all I'm going to say this, the person I'll be talking to today is actually the inspiration behind this podcast. And she was one of the reasons why we started this podcast in the first place. And I, I can't wait to talk to her today about this, you know, journey we've had together. And I'm super excited about this podcast. So if you guys are interested to please keep watching. All right. Without further ado, meet our guest. Miss Shahina Bakoyeva. Hey, Miss Shahina. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. So it's awesome. It's great to have you on the podcast finally. Thanks yeah. for having me too. Right. Is, would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? I honestly have so much to say about you, but mm -hmm. I guess it's best if it's coming from you. Sure. Yeah. My name is Shahina Bakoyeva, and I'm a 20 year old senior student at Bukhara State University. Right. And so you are working here at Adastra at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's the part you actually left out. Oh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I was actually, actually kind of hoping that you'd mention that first. <laughs> well, I'm actually working in Adastra for, I've been working here for like one and a half years now, and that's kind of like my second home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, we'll get to that part later. Mm -hmm. I, I'd love to talk more about you know, you're joining at Astra and your experience here and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think the proper way to kickstart this podcast, aside from the intro introduction, would be talking about your past, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, before we agreed to have this podcast, one of the things I asked you was if you could go into your past because you had quite a bit of you know, challenges in, in the past. And, and, and I know it's hard for you to get into those topics, those conversations, but I, I was hoping we could turn this podcast into sort of a biopic, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. right? And and ultimately, I think it's those challenges that describe you best, yeah. right? Sure. So yeah, would you like to tell us a little about your childhood, your your mm-hmm. your upbringing? Okay, sure. I was born in a village and I still live there. It's uh-huh. in Kagan. It's kind of like a small village. Uh-huh. Um, if anyone knows, it's called Yangi Hayat. And um, yeah, I was born there and I've been living there for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Right. And what was it like growing up in that little village? Well, it was one word amazing because oh. I am one of those girls who have been brought up by um, grandparents mm-hmm. and it was really amazing journey you know like being brought up by them because um like even though i could like barely see my mom because she was like 24 7 at work and she didn't really have time to spend with us mm-hmm. um like i was my granddad's mm-hmm. like um girl you know like we whenever whatever he used to go he used to take us there and he used to spend a lot of time with us. Even though my granny passed away like five years ago, yep, um, we still live together with my granddad, and it's so reassuring and amazing. Mm-hmm. Right, right. What are some memories you have of your grandparents from mm-hmm. your childhood? Mm-hmm. So obviously, I have a lot of positive memories. I literally remember. They used to, even like especially my granny, she used to uh, make us wake up at seven in the morning, making us um, have breakfast. Like mm-hmm. if we didn't have breakfast, she never let us go. And then she herself used to take us to um, our kindergarten, to our school, even though the school was not a mile away, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, I used to love them. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I remember reading in one of your posts on your channel that you grew up without a dad so what was it like being raised by a single mom Mm -hmm. so actually um when i was i wasn't even a year old when my mom and dad divorced well actually it just sounds very weird to say this word because i've never ever called anyone dad before Mm -hmm. um and when my mom was pregnant for my brother they actually divorced and that's why I don't really remember the times mm-hmm. that we spent together. I don't really remember even his face, mm-hmm. even though he's my neighbor. <laughs> what? Your, yes. dad, your dad lives next door. Yes. Not necessarily he and his family, but his mother mm-hmm. and his brothers. Mm-hmm. So they live right in front of our house. And you see your dad sometimes when he comes around to see his family. Mm-hmm. I rarely saw him, actually. I can actually count the times, um, probably three or four times, and from a mile away. Mm -hmm. And I know that he also wears glasses. You ever talk to him? Never. I've never talked to him. He actually wanted to um, come to see me when I was at hospital. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that because, come on, like, you have never talked to this person like mm-hmm. how how are you gonna even start the conversation and first of all who is gonna ask permission to come and see the daughter right that's that's weird mm-hmm. obviously my answer was no I didn't want to see him um, just because I don't have anything to say to him I, I don't hate him I don't love him I don't have any feelings towards him mm-hmm. I mean if if he want if he wanted to live like that then it's his life his choice if he didn't want to be with us, then mm-hmm. good for him. I mean, it's honestly so shocking to hear that from you because I'd assume someone who grew up without a dad would want to get at least a chance to ask them why they left him in the first place. Mm-hmm. They yeah. would expect some answers. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just uh, surprising that you don't have that feeling of missing out, it's that you don't have that feeling of yeah. n- n- your dad being absent in your life. You know what? That's that's like one of those questions that everybody asks from me. Well, there is a thing. So if you have never tried something, mm-hmm. how can you crave about it? Mm-hmm. Like how can you crave for it? I mean, I have never seen, I have never had this like father kindness or like fathers uh, like showing affection. And I have never seen that. Mm-hmm. So I don't really think that if you have never experienced it, you're going to, you know, mm-hmm. miss it. So, right. Never. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you need that sort of father figure in your life. Right. And I'm guessing your grandpa stepped yeah. in and filled that 
void in your life. And, and my that's, uncle. And your uncle, yep. right? He's a great uncle. Well, actually, like, he has, like, two daughters mm -hmm. and a son. And I have a brother. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle can at times be harsh towards my brother, like, like he is with his son. But... Like he, he was never harsh to me. He never even raised his voice and he was all the time so gentle. And he was the first guy who taught me how to drive a car, actually. <laughs> wow, yes. sounds like a pretty cool uncle. Yes, even right. though my mom doesn't give her a car to me, uh -huh. I can actually get the car with the help of my uncle. <laughs> yes. So you guys are like partners in crime, right? Yes, That's what are. you are. Right, 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 right. Uh, no, I see now why you don't have that you know, urge to see your dad or talk to him because you have all these dad figures in your life, feeling that emptiness, feeling yes. that missing role. Yeah, yeah. And so fast forward to your high school. Mm -hmm. What was Shahina like in high school? Oh. Um. Feisty, <laughs> angry, lively, okay. positive. I can tell that I was nothing like this. Mm -hmm. Like Shahina that you're seeing right now, mm -hmm. like I was nothing like that when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So when I was teenager, I used to be, uh, so let me start ex like um, describing my appearance first. So I was like one of those short girls, mm -hmm. um, chubby. I mean, you're still short. <laughs> no offense though. <laughs> but I'm not that short right yeah. now. Um, and I was kind of like chubby. I couldn't even run, uh -huh. but I was athletic. Um, till seventh grade, I attended gymnastics and there was a time when I was like fourth grade or fifth grade, um, my mom actually wanted my brother to attend Taekwondo and it was like private. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why she had to pay the money beforehand. So turns out my brother didn't want that. And he was one of those spoiled, like, mm -hmm. um, youngest child in the family. And my granny wanted him to stay at home. So my mom asked me that, uh, why, like, I don't go there mm -hmm. because there was no refund, you know, mm -hmm. it was summer holidays and I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And then I started, um, attending like, um, Taekwondo and right after our session there was boxing. Well, and you left it out in your resume when you applied for a job. Okay. Yeah. I better watch out. This girl knows how to karate, how to Taekwondo. Uh -oh. <laughs> and judo classes. So. I would stay right after class, like watching them, you know, like doing the, like everything training. And this thing actually changed my whole life. After that, I became like kind of, you know, tomboy. Mm -hmm. And I used to have a lot of guy friends mm -hmm. and I was fighty and I wasn't calm actually. Okay. And then, um, till 11th grade, I no till eighth grade or seventh grade, I, continued attending sports but after getting my trauma i immediately stopped it mm -hmm. then i paid attention to education going to attending courses and mm -hmm. yep and here i am just a quick question do you still know some taekwondo moves do you still know how to, still how to throw a punch how yes, to kick i do yeah then i better watch out <laughs> I, i'm I, okay i'm gonna watch my mouth next time i'm talking to this lady <laughs> Yeah. No, you don't have to. Because every time we're having a staff meeting or there's a problem, just running my mouth, not ever worrying, I'm getting punched in the face. But now you, you brought this up, oh, my sure. life is never going to be the same. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And your, yeah, what, what happened then? You said you after you got your trauma mm -hmm. you decided to quit karate and yep. t t get into studying right so mm -hmm. what you study would you 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 start learning languages mm -hmm. math biology science subjects well you know what my mom actually had a week long fight with me to make me study cuz even mm -hmm. though i was one of those toppers at school mm -hmm. i my focus was never on education. I never wanted to be like a teacher or someone who works in education field. And finally she could convince me and I started attending mother tongue courses, I guess, and history. I was really interested in biology, but um, I, I didn't know chemistry. That's why I, 
I couldn't just, I, I thought that I would never be able to enter university. So I attended mother tongue history classes and ninth grade, at ninth grade, I started learning English. Mm -hmm. And then at 10th grade, I started attending IELTS and then I got my first score there. Yeah, and what was your first score at the time? Seven. Seven. Yes. Yeah, not bad. With about a year of prep, you got seven, right? No, it was um, two, two years grammar and five months IELTS. Mm -hmm. And right. it was quarantine, quarantine at that time. There was lockdown. Uh, it was back in 2020. Can, can we pause for a second? You said two years grammar? Yep. You learned English grammar for two straight years. Uh, let me make it clear. My school was specialized at teaching English mm -hmm. and math. Mm -hmm. That's why I learned it at school. Mm -hmm. As I said, I used to study good at school, even though I was not really interested in learning mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. I used to study good. Our teacher mm -hmm. was very good. Right, right. Yeah. So you're ta you, so your English learning experience, grammar, specifically was part of the school curriculum yes, yes. so you're saying you did not take any extra classes no. on top of the school, school curriculum no. got it got it so what i was thinking is you took some extracurricular classes mm -hmm. to improve your english on top of the english classes you were getting mm -hmm. at school and you did it for two years because in two years that's more than enough to go from zero to getting ielts nine <laughs> as far as i'm concerned but uh -huh, yes. anyway i'm just uh -huh. kidding right mm -hmm. two years and then you prepped for ielts for about five months right yes. five six months and you got seven your first attempt which is which is amazing which is yeah clearly you have you have a knack for learning languages how many languages do you know by the way well you know what i kind of hate this question and uh -huh. i don't understand when people say i can speak this 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 language because in my head they are there is mixture you know if i combine English, Russian, Uzbek, Tajik, mm -hmm. it's going to be a perfect language for me. I can express mm -hmm. like whatever is up here, you know. Mm -hmm. So with, with one sentence, I can say I can't speak any of them 100%. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And then... But, um, but you know five languages, right? You said you counted Uzbek, Tajik, Russian, English, and... Turkish. You know Turkish. Yes. Like what, what's your level on Turkish? I think it's either A2 or B1. Mm hmm a like conversational level Turkish, yes. right? And how did you learn Turkish? Um, if I tell it, okay, I think I'm going to be judged for that, but I watched it, uh, I watched a lot of mm -hmm. soap operas, mm -hmm. Turkish series, you mm -hmm. know. Oh. I used to be crazy about watching them. Uh, well, what, 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 which one was your favorite? There is, okay, there is one called um, Black Love. You guys can't believe it. That is the TV show I literally had in mind. Okay. I thought you were going to say it. I thought you were going to say it. It's got like eight seasons, a lot of seasons, right? No, no way. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I haven't watched it till the end. Uh -huh. I just watched it as an amateur learner, as the uh -huh. beginner, you know? I wanted to learn Turkish. That's why uh -huh. I gave it a try. And then after watching like five or six series, mm -hmm. I get really bored. And then mm -hmm. I switch to another movie. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. I, but why is it your favorite? I remember watching only the first episode of the show and I didn't like it much. Right. It's about mm -hmm. a cop, right? Who falls in love with a girl, right? Cop? A cop, a police officer. No. It's not, a, it's no, not that? It's a different right. one. So anyway, so what would you like about this TV show, Black Love? You said dark love or black love? Black. Why not dark? Uh, why is it, it black? It can be dark. Dark. No, seriously. How do you, how does it translate into English? In Russian, this is Chorna Elibov. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's dark love. And dark it must be dark love in okay. English. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. So why did you like this TV show? Well, uh, at first, I didn't like it that much mm -hmm. because I didn't understand anything there. And then after watching like 10 episodes, I guess, mm -hmm. I started understanding and getting the meaning and everything. Mm -hmm. I actually watched it without subtitles. That's why it was kind of challenging at first. And then um, I like... I liked uh, the main characters and how, like, you know, the plot was really surprising, you know? You, you think that this is going to happen for sure, but mm -hmm. something different, like you have, like, you never expect mm -hmm. it happens, so. So there are a lot of plot twists. Yes. Right? It just keeps you keeps hooked. You 
yeah, like catch you off guard and uh-huh. that's that's insane, you know? Right. And the thing is, um, the thing that really attracts me to this kind of films is um, they are not even, they are nowhere near like to be real. Mm-hmm. This kind of things can never happen. You mean like the life. scenarios are too far-fetched? Yes. They don't normally happen in real life. What's one scenario that, that you saw on that TV show that you think is far-fetched? Mm-hmm. Right? Because so as someone who's, who's, who's been paying attention to a lot of things lately, to things going on on the internet, social media, I think there are a lot of plot, there are way more plot twists in life than there are in TV shows. Yeah, TV shows probably. actually mimic life. Mm-hmm. Art mimics life. So what's, what's one plot twist that had you holding your head? Mm-hmm. So at the end of the final season, if, if you guys have watched Spoiler it. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. No, I think everyone watched it because there was like 10 million views there. Uh-huh. Like within a year. Uh-huh. So um, there there was like two main, there were two main characters and one of them had to die there like because there was literally bomb, you know? Like the guy, the rich guy bombed it. Everyone thought the other guy died, but turns out he didn't die. And I was like, wow. Then how did he survive that bomb? Uh, no idea, because this was the last mm-hmm. season that I watched and I never watched that film again. Well, uh, how do you explain that honestly? I don't know how to... You should watch that next season, uh, next episode. We we need to find out what what happened sure. to that guy. Sure. <laughs> but are you sure he survived that bomb? Yes, because right. I read some comments there, uh-huh. and people were like, they were also shocked, like me. They were saying like, Nah, Kemal is not gonna die. By the way, Kemal is the main character's uh-huh. name, one of the main characters' uh-huh. name. And they were like, No, guys, don't worry, he's gonna survive. And I was uh-huh. like, Wow. Was it the end of the show, or there are more episodes after? This was that? the end of first season. Uh huh. And is there a season two? Yes. Have you seen it? No. Not yet. You should. You should for sure. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm getting psyched about this TV show. Not sure if I'm ever, ever checking it out, but anyway, I really want to know what happened to that guy, mm-hmm. Kamal. He said, right? Sure. Yeah. Kamal. Kamal. That is what you call a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. So this is the strategy they use in filmography and. And TV shows at the end of the movie or the TV show, they live an unexplained ending that makes yes. you want to come back and watch the next episode exactly. or ne- and watch the next season. Yeah, that's yes. smart if you think about it. Right, right. Yeah, five languages, five languages. That's just so that makes you polyglot, right? Someone who speaks five languages, they, mm-hmm. they call it polyglot, right? I don't know, uh, maybe. Yeah, probably. I so your experience of speaking five languages, you know what? I'm actually in awe of the fact that you speak English so well, because sometimes I think about myself and I think the only reason why I can speak English as well as I do, which is not insanely good, honestly, but still above moderate level is because of the fact that I speak it all the time. But you've managed to maintain this level of fluency despite the fact that you, the entire day you're switching languages at university. I'm guessing mm-hmm. you speak Uzbek. Uzbek, Tajik. Uzbek, Tajik with your students. So I hear you sometimes speak Uzbek. Unfortunately, she's not supposed to be speaking Uzbek under this roof, right? At Astra Premises, yes. English only, right? And I'm at home, I'm guessing you speak to your mom in Tajik. Tajik, Tajik. sometimes Uzbek. Yeah, sometimes Turkish. No, she, she doesn't, doesn't know understand. Turkish. Yeah. Anyway, right. And you've ma- ma- managed to maintain this level of fluency, which, if you ask me, is is no joke. I, I, don't, I honestly don't think I could ever accomplish that. It's one of my biggest fears. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think ev- I'm ever in the future gonna be able to speak Uzbek, Tajik, English throughout the day and be fluent in all of them. But you sound like you are. You are fluent in pretty much all languages you speak, or at least you have the confidence that makes it seem like you're fluent. Oh, okay, sure. Right. Because so my dominant uh-huh. right now, the dominant one is English. I'm so relieved right now. I'm so relieved to hear that because that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, as, as an English teacher, right? Yes. Right. right. I mean, it changed when I came here. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie because, um, as I said, like one and a half years ago, mm-hmm. I used to speak like other languages, not 
English all the time because even though I used to teach at that time, like I I never spoke in mm-hmm. English because you know what? Sometimes students level you need to take their level into account, and sometimes they do not under, do not understand what you're saying. So you have mm-hmm. to switch to Uzbek, mm-hmm. their native language. But when I came here. I was shocked because mm-hmm. everyone here spoke in English and I was like, wow, mm-hmm. that's insane. Mm-hmm. And then I also started speaking only in English here. After a while, after like six or seven months, I started forgetting other languages. And I remember one crazy story. I left this building at around nine. It mm-hmm. was late and I commute from distance. That's why it's it's very difficult to catch a taxi. So there was a taxi driver and we bargained for the price and... Uh, on the way, he started talking about Alt City and how many, like the number of the number of tourists he took there. And he talked about one place that was newly opened there. And he asked me whether I know it or not. Mm-hmm. And you know what I said? Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I know it in English. Mm-hmm. And he was looking at me as if, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, I, I, I was alien or something. Mm-hmm. And then it hit me, you know, I realized that mm-hmm. what did I do? Mm-hmm. And like till the end of my destination i just Mm. kept my mouth shut (laughs) that must have been awkward right it was because there was awkward silence he wasn't saying anything looking at me and Uh i wasn't also saying anything Uh knowing that i screwed up so the only thing you said was that line and that was in english i said yes i know Uh that place it's good or amazing i said something Uh like that right right because probably at the time you were thinking something in english in your mind about your class the next day or your work it was right. after, um, like, like uh-huh. your speaking class. Uh huh. Yes. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sometimes you f- forget to change hats. Yeah. 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 That uh, th- quite thankfully though never happened to me. I'm very conscious of which language I'm speaking. Very mm. super conscious of what I'm speaking, right? Because I feel like I have this persona I have to keep up, keep mm-hmm. keep up, right? But it's not really persona. It's it's it is the real me. And is I've lately been getting a lot of accusations about me being fake. Who said that? The entire staff working here. Oh, being fake about what? I, I don't know the way I express myself or the points I have about how things should be run here, right? And earlier today, I had a, there was a student case that needed tending to, and I was talking to this student. She, she was. She's she's a teenager, right? And she was she was in tears, clearly not happy about what had happened. Mm-hmm. There was a little conflict with her teacher, and we were trying to resolve the situation. And and so I told her to go home to get some rest and to get get some sleep, and to to text me back when she finally comes to her senses, right? And she did. She got back to me and said, "Teacher, I appreciate you doing this." And here are the options I have. And she's very thoughtful and thorough in the way she explains things, which I really appreciate. And and one of the last comments she made, teacher, I'm not a kid though. Please don't pretend like I don't know that you're being fake when you say this or that. She literally said that. I I, I didn't know how to react to that. Probably because just the way I carry myself strikes people Mm -hmm. as, strikes, comes across as fake, but... Um, I'm, I, I'd like to think I'm nothing fake. So I told her this in response. I said, if only you realize how much I care about you, right? And I hope that did the, 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 the trick. She texted me back. She texted me back later and I haven't, I'm yet to get back to her messages. Anyway, yeah. So like switching languages can be, for you, it sounds like a walk in the park, but with me though, it's, 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 it's not easy. It's not, especially when I'm speaking Tajik and Uzbek, I feel so out of place and mm-hmm. anxious about it because simply because of the fact that I'm limited in my vocabulary and, and, and when other people start, start talking, it, it feels so overbearing because yes. I'm not able to keep up. I'm not able to uh, compete, but mm-hmm. they have control over me. And I don't like that feeling because I'm accustomed to being always in control here. I'm a, it's, as mm-hmm. someone who likes being always in charge. Right? You know what? Sometimes like speaking in your native language can mm-hmm. be difficult just because uh, you are not exposed to that mm-hmm. or you don't read a lot of books. Mm-hmm. 
because literally the same thing mm -hmm. like is with me because even though i never spoke english like when i was at school i could never speak like fluently mm -hmm. in uzbek whenever they wanted me to take part in competitions and anywhere i used to just stand like um like in front of people and could say nothing mm -hmm. like if i learned them by heart memorized like the things written on the book i could speak but if they made me speak like coming up if they told me to come up with some kind of ideas i literally like remember pausing there mm -hmm. yeah and the same happens at university and the worst part is people think you're an idiot yes <laughs> or a retard yes or a retard i i i am um, every time i'm in the locker room at the gym right just random people start conversation hey are you a newcomer here are you is this your first day here and i say no i've been around for almost two years here right and it, and they're complimenting my physique oh you're you look in fantastic shape right and then i don't really know what to say all i do is nod i say yes no and then when they ask me an open-end question where you can't say yes or no and i have to give them a long speech long answer right and i then start talking and their their face instantly turns sour <laughs> like what's going on what, what is this guy is everything okay with this guy right it just makes me feel weird it really does. It really does. Uh, speaking of learning languages, you see, you think it's an obvious choice for girls out there to get into language studies? Because I feel like a lot for a lot of the ladies, it's it's like the it's a set path. If you were to go and ask school girls right now or high school girls, what are you gonna do in the future? I bet nine out of ten of them would say, I want to learn English. So wh why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. I think it is not only with English, but also other languages, because mm -hmm. I remember reading in one article, there it said, like, most of the girls, um, their left hemisphere works better. Like, I don't know whether it's correct it's, or so not, but with people. Be better than the right hemisphere or yeah. better than boys? <laughs> If, if, Maybe both. If, if, uh, that, we need to ch fact check that, okay? I'm not going to let this one slide, guys. I'm not going to just sit here and take it from sure. her. All right, we need to fact check it, okay? I'm standing up for you, boys. Yes, and most of the boys tend to be good at uh, subjects like math, mm -hmm. physics, you know, chemistry. But when it comes to girls, they are good at other languages like history, mm -hmm. learning languages, and other things. And so this is the first reason. Second reason, most of the girls here they want to you know go abroad mm -hmm. study in other countries i don't know i have never even seen a guy mm -hmm. wanting to learn you know like many languages mm -hmm. it's all the time girls yeah right right and even if a boy were to get into language learning they just do it for conversation reasons right yep. most of them would probably just do it for conversation and because most of the language time, is not really our strongest suit yes it's it's the lady's strong suit yep. or or am i am i being am i being a sexist here saying that it's mostly boys thing or the girls i thing? don't think so yeah. i agree with that because if we pay attention to a lot of jobs that mm -hmm. require communication skills like women work there more mm -hmm. right that yeah. that also i stole it also from one of those articles mm -hmm. right <laughs> yes because right. uh whenever uh receptionists for for example mostly girls and uh for example like teachers 90 percent of the teachers at school all of them are like women mm -hmm. even like principals you know like authorities all of them are women mm -hmm. so i think that's the main reason yeah you see men mostly and uh feels like construction, real estate, right? Yep. Or restaurant business, something along those lines. Yep. Right, right. Or women uh, work in salons, mm -hmm. right? Where a lot of people come daily. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In the services industry, right? And yes, plus they have mm -hmm. to know other languages. In Bihara, for example, like you can't survive if you know, if you are monolingual, you mm -hmm. can't survive mm -hmm. because a lot of people are... I'm still alive, though. <laughs> I speak English predominantly, but... But you speak Tajik and Uzbek, too. You understand it, at least. Yeah, at least I understand, right? Yes. You get a point. Yeah. Because I remember once um, there was a student um, in my class. She only could speak Russian. But mm -hmm. other students, they 
didn't even understand it. And that girl couldn't understand anything just because we never spoke in Russian. Because mm-hmm. if I speak Russian, other students don't mm-hmm. understand. If I speak in Uzbek, she doesn't understand. And that was the main reason why she had to drop out mm-hmm. at the time, because we didn't have other options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least if other students understood it, at least, we could just, you know, keep her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good thing we don't have that problem anymore because we have a lot of Russian teachers and we've streamlined the pro- process more or less. We we got we got now Russian groups, right? Yes. And Russian t- teachers. And so plus, that, that most of the students, like Russian students coming here, they don't really need Russian explanation. Mm-hmm. For example, I had my PA12 mm-hmm. and we never spoke in Russian there. Mm-hmm. Never. That's mm-hmm. impossible. Never. You can ask from those students. You said PI 12, right? Yes. I know ask. some students while there, they've never lied to me. Yeah. I'm going to follow up on yes. this. Yes. You may ask from like anyone there. Uh-huh. We never spoke in Russian. Yes. They used to translate like texts when they were in IF level uh-huh. in Russian. Mm-hmm. But once they were promoted to PI, mm-hmm. not Russian, not Uzbek at all. If there are any PI 12 students watching this podcast right now, I need you to leave your comments here. Right, we need. I need you to tell me to confirm what she just yes. said because I don't believe her. It's so hard <laughs> to believe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I feel like teachers here are speaking Russian or Tajik or Uzbek the first chance they get because they don't like this always English policy. Here is the thing. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we need to explain. No, I meant outside classroom, outside. Like today, literally earlier today, I caught two two of the teachers chatting in Uzbek. And as soon as they saw me, they switched to English. Mm-hmm. And they think I'm, I'm deaf. They think that I'm some 80-year-old guy who can't hear. But sometimes we need to speak in mm-hmm. Uzbek even to PI-level students. No, right? I'm talking about those, uh, those informal chats you have with your mm-hmm. colleagues when you have hangouts. Mm-hmm. What language do you speak when you have hangouts with your, with your colleagues English. here? She just lied. I didn't. I think, I think we should have a lie detector. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know one of those YouTube videos yes. where they have wires attached to you? I know. Well, we, need, we need one of those here. Please. No, mostly we speak in English because I know, you know, we unconsciously do that. We don't do it purposefully because <laughs> the moment that I, that I realized it was when people started looking weirdly at us, mm-hmm. like awkwardly. They mm-hmm. were giving us those weird looks and then we realized that we weren't speaking in Uzbek or Tajik or... Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, let them be. Those, those people are going to give you weird looks anyway. I always get weird looks from everybody Mm -hmm. but it's not as weird anymore because we have so many foreigners coming into Bukhara we we got we we got people from Pakistan India right different countries speaking so many different languages this place is becoming more linguistically diverse yes yeah yeah if you just get a tattoo no one can tell you're a nose back (laughs) or if you dye your hair and start like styling it no one is gonna say that you're a nose nose back yeah yeah yes you, 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 people would think that you're just an outsider, right? Yeah. But I don't think, I suppose I can't get away with that because I'm Asian and short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because one of the qualities, one of the features of foreigners is that they're, they t- they're tall, they're massive, they're huge. Not all of I'm them. I'm talking about Europeans, Caucasians, mm-hmm. Americans. Yeah, they're usually tall, right? Yeah. Anyway, going back to your uh, experience of learning languages, right? Would you like to talk more about uh, what happened after you got your first seven? So how did your language learning, English learning experience unfold? unfold? Mm-hmm. So basically after getting my IELTS, as I say, it was locked down. It was back in 2020. I stopped mm-hmm. practicing English. But I used to, I remember I used to speak. I used to talk to myself in front of the mirror every day because I never wanted to lose my edge, you know. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to keep that. And I was preparing for mother tongue and I was also studying at school. That's why they made me participate in English Olympiads. And yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. I stopped attending like English courses, but still I was practicing it at home. So what was your next attempt after seven? When I came here. Yeah. It was like after two and a half years, Uh I came here back in 2022. Mm -hmm. Yes. Almost, or no, 2023. Think, no, it was 2023. Yes, that it was, was 20, yes. 23. So it means my IELTS was 
like it had already been expired mm-hmm. and when i came here i didn't even have certificate and mm-hmm. anything and i like i used to you know like constantly doubt myself and when i came here with like two months of prep Alicia teacher made me like he all the time used to made me you know like force me to take the test as soon mm-hmm. as possible you remember our first conversation yes the admission interview yes I you do. still do yes what do you remember about that interview everything so mm-hmm. the moment that i started like um you asked me to introduce myself and the moment that mm-hmm. i started speaking um uh, you were giving me weird look mm-hmm. <laughs> i remember that and your and his first sentence was his first words were like we are not accepting you he said mm-hmm. and i was like what mm-hmm. because literally in your like admission in admission post you guys said 60 6.5 plus mm-hmm. candidates we are accepting and i got was the average of 32 i got 34 in reading 31 in listening i think you're ranked first on that no, admission i wasn't that wasn't you no nope. okay and then i was like what is this guy talking about mm-hmm. i perfectly scored almost 7.5 why he's not gonna like accept mm-hmm. me i think he wanted to you know like check you wanted to you wanted to make sure that i actually want it or not right i think your memory is a little sketchy so let me fill the missing parts uh, you mean the job exactly yes i turned you down from getting into the program because uh, on that first interview on the spot i made you a job offer yes and i didn't want that not because i was afraid because I didn't have IELTS. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the confirmation, you know, mm-hmm. to tell people, "Hey, look, I can teach," you uh-huh. know. And plus, if you don't have it, you don't feel confident in front of in front of your students. That's why I was like, "Teacher, give me some time." And then you said, "Okay," but right after like after a month, you gave me my first group. Mm-hmm. And I started like attending both your classes and teaching at the same time. Yep. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> right. And so and then you signed up for the test sometime in in August? No. Right? I came here in and April and registered to 28th, 24th of July. Mhm. June it was. It was June. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you got overall 8 yep. in that attempt. Yes. Right? So how was your reaction to getting an 8? Um after a long break. You know what? It was so satisfying mm-hmm. seeing that awesome eight mm-hmm. cuz you know what? At that time as I said I started like teaching and there was a lot of pressure. And I kind of sensed that because my students were looking for that, my teachers and like everyone, everyone that knew me. And not gonna lie, I didn't want to get eight and a half at that time cuz I knew that I couldn't. but at least i wanted to get a and when i got the notification from uh bc i couldn't open it for i don't know like how how long i was just pausing it was early in the morning 8:30 probably and i was really afraid started praying as if it's going to change something and then i just you know like found the courage to click on it and i didn't even look at anything but overall mm-hmm. i didn't even like um look at sub scores when i saw that eight then i calm i was calm and then i started looking at other sections you know mm-hmm. yeah it was mm-hmm. it was so amazing to see that eight mm-hmm. because at that time i you know what i felt confident and a lot of people told me that how was i working here in mm-hmm. adastra mm-hmm. without ielts mm-hmm. and getting that eight was an answer to their question mm-hmm. right yes. A cool question here. Did you feel more satisfied when you got your 8 than when you got your 8.5? Should I be honest? Hon- honest is best policy. So, I was more satisfied when I got my first 8 uh-huh. instead of 8 and a half. Yeah. Because I knew that it would be 8 and a half when and, I said that. And we the still test. don't have your 8.5 certificate. I told you to frame it and put it on the wall in the lobby. Did we get her certificate? But we ha- we got her certificate, yes. right? All right, guys, do me a favor and get frames first thing tomorrow, okay? Uh, Alicia is a little busy these uh, these days. She's got a lot on his plate, so you can get those frames yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just 
yeah, put it on the school expense. Just get those uh, three, four frames. We need three frames, right? Yeah, yeah, get us three, four frames. Thank you. Yeah, y y your certificate is going up on that wall yeah. first thing tomorrow. Yeah, sure, Consider thanks. Consider it done. Yeah, you can thank Mr. Abbas because I'm not doing it. Sure, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. And with 8.5 in in the pocket, in your pocket, I, I, well, I guess the question everyone is wondering to know, wondering to ask is, is nine on the horizon? You mean, do I want to get it? Yeah. Not? Mm -hmm. You know what I realized? Like, before getting my 8.5, I thought that getting this is going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. I thought that once I get it, I feel satisfied and everything. But as soon as I saw my score, not going to lie, I was happy, but... I wasn't that satisfied. I wasn't that happy as I thought I would be, you mm -hmm. know? That's why I think the same is going to happen with nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not chasing it. Let me be honest with you. Right now, I don't want this. But mm -hmm. even if I get it, I think the same is going to happen as I got my eight mm -hmm. and a half. Are you just going to be cool with it? Yeah. Yeah, just going to... I'll just um, give another try, mm -hmm. try it over and over again, as Alicia's teacher says. I think like to this point, you know, I have taken the test seven times so far. And when my examiner asks me ever, mm -hmm. like, what's your hobby? I think I'm going to say taking the test. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And inspired by Alicia. Yes. Yeah. Alicia sounds like a big inspiration to you. I mean, he all the time, like constantly pushes me, you know, like uh, for updating my score and mm. everything whenever I get. You're like, telling me you don't get that push from me? I do. C come on. No, that's, but that's... score update mostly from Alicia teacher. Uh -huh. From you, you know what? I have learned a lot in terms of teaching. I mean, Edestra is the very first place that I attended and so like individual attention. Mm -hmm. Like if you attend other courses here anywhere, like as far as the ones that I know, they don't really care about student psychology, mm -hmm. which really pisses me off because students can be going through a lot and those teachers do not simply understand it. And when I came here, when you offered me your therapy session right after our first class, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Like I went home, I couldn't even process it. I was like, what does mm -hmm. it cost? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it even? Like, I have heard the words therapy, mm -hmm. but never know. Like, I, I didn't know how it looks, mm -hmm. like what you should tell there. And I remember, like, both of us were sitting here in 101, and I was looking at you, like, not knowing what to say, you know? Because you told me that we are going to have therapy session, but I didn't know, like, how is it going to go? So I learned how to approach your students, pay attention to their mental and psychological like physical well-being everything yeah right speaking of teaching how do you feel about your early days of work here at ad astra mm -hmm. what were they like how did you like teaching and how yeah. how does teaching here at ad astra compare to teaching someplace else aside from uh, tending to students psychological needs mm -hmm. I vividly remember the first day when I taught my first group here, I have eight. Mm -hmm. And on the same day I had, I have 25. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, teaching here in Adastra is more comfortable quality wise mm -hmm. because there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, we have TV here. Uh, we can just, instead of relying on the board, mm -hmm. like, Mostly, we can show them some, you know, like pictures, we can show them some videos to, you know, engage students a little bit. Because if you are teaching like teenage level, like students, you know that they get bored easily. So you have to, you know, like engage them somehow, you make the class intriguing and exciting. So, yes, for in, in terms of this, teaching in Adestra is best. Mm -hmm. And plus, Students coming here, students signing up here, they are going to be tested, which means like uh, we are not going to accept like um, zero level students in IF program, right? So it's also easier for teachers to speak in some of the IF groups. You don't have to speak in English, you mm -hmm. know, uh, sorry, Uzbek, like 100% English, mm -hmm. which is really good. And that's how it's supposed to be because IELTS foundation. 
the IF, by the way, is an acronym for IELTS Foundation. Foundation yeah, because yeah. some of the viewers here may not understand yes. what you're talking about. Yeah, it's one of the programs we teach here. It's just a, a very beginning phase of IELTS. Yes. Like a, like a pre-IELTS thing, but not exactly pre-IELTS, right? Yep. It's the, the stage that comes before that. Right, right, right. And what was your what, what was your expectation of like not expectation like prior to joining the school how did you feel about getting uh, being part of the team mm -hmm. i never thought that i would get i would just be hired here as a mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. as i said i all the time doubted myself i never like believed what i could do like never mm -hmm. and when you offered me a job i was in awe mm -hmm. i was shocked mm -hmm. and when i started like working here the atmosphere the environment was and still is amazing mm -hmm. because you know what i have worked in two places before coming here and i can tell you the difference is huge i'm not telling this right now just because i'm working here like i'm 100 percent honest right now there is healthy competition mm -hmm. you know like whenever you step up your game like no one is jealous mm -hmm. everyone is happy for you mm -hmm. like literally everyone but when i worked in other places you know what happens there mm -hmm. like not exactly uh, uh, you have never worked no i never found myself competing with other people so i honestly don't know how you it don't compete it your boss actually compares mm -hmm. you with other people even mm -hmm. though he or she knows that you're doing your job mm -hmm. but Oh, they say like, look at that teacher. He's doing that. She's yeah. doing that, and you're not doing this. Yes. But you, you never see me saying that on the Snapchat sometimes because I do. I say, you guys should hmm. take take a cue from this lady, or you should but take a cue from that teacher. But you never compare us to each other. Mm -hmm. You never say this person is doing better than that person, or this person is doing mm -hmm. a terrible job. Uh, just for quick disclosure, I used to do that with students. Mm -hmm. I I used to be that guy. I'm. That's long, long, long time ago. And I learned the hard way that it's a recipe for disaster. Yep. Right? It just makes mm, this frustrating life of a student or, or of, a, of a person even more frustrating. Exactly. Right? It, yeah, it's just like adding insult to injury. That's what it is. Exactly. And, and I was actually told this by students literally a few times they text me and sometimes come to me crying and say teacher you should not be doing this uh it really it hurts us a lot and i didn't realize at the time because i lacked teaching competence mm -hmm. right now, if it weren't for those students who opened up about the how they felt about the way i treat other students about the fact that i compared them i would have never learned my lessons and i'd be no different from those teachers who used to work with you mm -hmm. used to work with Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it was an important learning curve for me. That's very mm -hmm. miserable when people get compared mm -hmm. to someone else, mm -hmm. knowing that they are doing their job, mm -hmm. dedicating themselves. Mm -hmm. And plus, when your students start getting better results, they try to get that group and give you another one. Mm -hmm. And let's let's not even talk about like money stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. Like, I was never interested in money, actually. Never. Mm -hmm. Because I was working just to keep myself busy. Mm -hmm. But the treatment that you get from, like, those workplaces, that's, that's like, you know, you, you can't bear. It's unbearable. Mm -hmm. And immediately, I realized that I wasn't, I was being mistreated there. I quit my job and then mm -hmm. started working on my own. I had my students there in my like little town and I used to work there like five hours every day. It was really good. It was going amazing. But then I realized that I have to work on myself as well. That was the like motif. That was the main reason why I came here. Mm -hmm. If you remember when I came here, I was still working. Yes, you were. Yes, because yes, I were. had to earn money to pay the like bills, mm -hmm. right? To mm -hmm. pay the course, right? Mm -hmm. And then I stop teaching in Kagan just because I didn't have time and mm -hmm. because I had my university I had my course here and commuting like back and forth it was mm -hmm. a big hassle mm -hmm. that's why I was like no I have to stop it mm -hmm. you know what you have to sacrifice something if you want to get something mm -hmm. so I I chose like personal development mm -hmm. yes over money 
at the time, pulling you out of that place was actually my number one priority. But if, because if you remember, I offered you to bring your students here yep. and teach in one of the rooms and I'd yes. be fine with that mm -hmm. because I remember you telling me about your past, you, you know, your condition at the time and it just, it was stuck in my head for months, not that days, not weeks, but months, for months. I, I'll get to that story later. But for now, what do you say we stick to the teaching aspect of things here at, at Astra, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. What, 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 we talked a lot. Of, we, we talked quite a bit about your favorite things here. So, do you have any pet peeves? Do you, is is there anything you dislike about? I can't this say I have pet peeves here, but uh -huh. things that come on, it can't be picture perfect, right? That there, there has to be something wrong. No, I don't hate it's, anything here, yeah, but yeah. there there are small things, small details that just annoy me. For example, grading sheet. <laughs> no, 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 no. I like grading sheet actually because yeah. this is something that motivates students. Uh -huh. That's one of the ways that I keep my students, you know, like uh -huh. um, aware that they are constantly being judged uh -huh. and their parents are observing. Uh -huh. No hate for grading sheet. Yeah. I sometimes get irritated mm -hmm. because um, I don't want to conduct my class is like two hours. Sometimes mm -hmm. I have to make it like three, mm -hmm. four hours just because um, there are a lot of students sometimes, 12 students in one class and you need to pay individual attention to mm -hmm. like each of them. And then sometimes we do in-class tests so it may last longer, right? Explanation, discussion. And then you need to free the room at the exact time, right? Mm -hmm. Because after your class, there must be another one. Mm -hmm. That's something that sometimes annoys me. Because when I'm just teaching, you know, like enthusiastically, you know, wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. a teacher opens the door and says, hey, are you freeing the room yeah. anytime soon? Yeah, it's even worse when it's a male teacher, right? Yes. <laughs> you just really want to yeah. shout at them, but you yeah. can't because yeah. your students are looking at you. And you're yeah. going to be like politely saying, yeah, yeah, five minutes. But yeah. you know that it's going to be 25 or 35 minutes. Yeah. And I hope that teacher is not watching this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Can we bury, hide this part of the podcast? Just put a misleading chapter. Yeah. Right? Like unicorns or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But not pet peeves. Right. You know what? If you want the room for your, to yourself for three hours, for five hours, for as long as you want, I think we can arrange that. Now that, now that we have another campus. Yes. But it's, it's possible because we got a lot of rooms there and they're going to be vacant for another year. I don't know for how long, right? It's a big school. It takes yes. a lot of time to fill that school with students. So That's actually what I had, had in, in mind. mind yeah. yeah. But there, there are some management aspect of things we're going to have to deal with first be, you know, before we do that. But, but, but it's possible. It, it is doable, right? An interesting question. What would you do if you were me for a day? Wow. Yeah. Interesting question. As the head of the school. Uh -huh. One of the heads of the school. Okay. So first of all, I would text all the teachers <laughs> in Uzbek. <laughs> I can do that right now. What do you want me to say? Oh no, come on. Do you, if you really want me to do that, I'll do it. Really? So, yeah. You for real? No, in your dreams. I'm sorry. <laughs> Never happening. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Yeah. I would text literally everyone that you're speaking in English. Uh huh. I would all of them, like text them in Uzbek, in Tajik, uh -huh. any other languages, but, but English. Not English. And you would do it the entire day. No, that would be the first thing. Mm -hmm. Second thing would be I would go out. Uh huh. Man, you sit all the time here. I would go out. Yeah. And then, um, but you would, what, where would you go out? Uh, that's my next answer. Uh -huh. So I would go to karaoke and video record myself and send it to staff group. Yeah. Oh, we can do it here right now. All right. Get us a phone. Someone we're going to sing, right? You don't have to go to a karaoke bar to do it. You can literally do it in the class oh. uh, outside teaching hours, obviously. Of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what? You can't sing here because the next mm -hmm. room there will mm -hmm. be like students yeah, and teachers teaching here yeah. yeah yes but this one is further like the 
yeah you know what you should give me a day to think about it because i would uh -huh. do a lot yeah but how about like the management side of things uh -huh. how would you run the school differently if you were me because hmm. i'm taking notes here okay so everything here is perfect you know i can't say you're doing something wrong because the school just came here mm -hmm. Like the school became a duster because of you guys. What would I change? Absence. Mm -hmm. I would like receptionists mm -hmm. to take all the absence instead mm -hmm. of teachers because, you know, teachers have a lot on their plate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they leave the school a bit later. Sometimes they may forget about it. Mm -hmm. So I would make receptionists do it. I'm sorry, Abbas. Yeah. But how would you know, how would they know someone was missing in your class? We do clock clock on a checklist, right? Mm -hmm. So when we go there, they can ask from teachers. Mm -hmm. But what if you have five groups and and there is two, three students missing in every single one of them and there's 15 students? And here's the thing. So when you have five groups, it means you have to answer like five different numbers there, mm -hmm. right? which is hassle for you, which is like... Oh, really? Aren't you supposed to just input your phone number in the platform? Isn't that... My phone works differently. Mm -hmm. I have to, you know, like, dial up back and, uh, like, do my, do my thing and then, mm -hmm. like, enter again. Mm -hmm. So you have to log in, log out using different phone numbers? Right? Different phone so, numbers. For so, example, if I have, like, let's say I have... Oh, I, I, let's not get to that part of the... Because it's a conf yeah. confidential, right? Right, right, right. And that part is... Yeah, it would be better if mm -hmm. receptions did it, but that's also fine. Right. Listen, is there any way we can have the platform creators? Yes, I would think and that was is not a problem, but mm -hmm. if they share normally range, it's mm -hmm. online, you can do it by watching the parents. Oh, so there you go. Problem solved. Share the online. Yeah, that's a problem. All right, then let's work it out. So you're going to text, but Nusivar is not going to like it. Nusivar is not going to like it. <laughs> I mean, I... No, I know it's not. Or, or it should be like, mm -hmm. uh, for example, like today, if I don't do it with absence, mm -hmm. tomorrow I can't do it. Mm -hmm. If it will be accessible to teachers, I guess, like mm -hmm. maybe I do it, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be easy. Right. I thought, I thought it was accessible to teachers too, or only manager account. No, manager account? Yeah, this is account oh, reception. Yeah. Yeah. Manager account. Right. Information. Oh, there's a Guys, whatever requests or feedback you have about the platform we use, you just let him know and he's going to reach out to creators and they'll reprogram it. But just anyways, artists. it's fine. I mean, that's fine, but mm -hmm. it would be better. It's what I have. I know, I know. And we're trying to be efficient here. And yeah, whatever you have in mind, just let this guy know. All right. He'll reach out and look into it, right? Yeah. And, and please, you need to get back to them again because the platform is, has been down for two days now. Yeah. That's a big setback. It's a big setback, right? Anything else you do different here aside from attendance check? No, everything is going better. Yeah. The materials, uh -huh. the textbooks, everything. Uh -huh. Right. So overall, you like working here? Yes. Yeah, right. How would you rate yourself as a teacher on on, on scale of zero to 10? I like you think I can answer mm -hmm. because here is the thing. Sometimes you may think that you were doing your job perfectly, mm -hmm. but like Miss Parizada. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, I'm gonna tease her about that next. I don't know for how long, but she's gonna get teased a lot about this. Like she is doing good. I know she is. I know she is. But today she had mental breakdown. You know that probably you should go watch the cameras again. What happened to her? I don't feel proud of how how I treated her, the way I talked, but, but it, it, it was a serious situation that it's been going on for so long. And I, I, I was just disappointed that it wasn't brought to my attention right away. And then they, they put it to the last minute. They waited until now to say this. Or maybe it's partly my fault because I'm not doing staff meetings myself regularly because I've been so caught up in so much work podcasting and this campus launch and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And she, and, and she had to take the fall, right? This, 
this, and which, which is not fair. She doesn't deserve to be treated this way. And the first thing I'm going to do when I get out this podcast is uh, reach out to her and apologize for the way I behaved. Yeah, but you need to remind me. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be a long podcast. So I still got a lot on my mind right now. And yeah, you said you wouldn't want to. You you wouldn't want to rate yourself as a teacher, right? No, because you should ask this for my students. Sure, fair enough, right? Say there is this image of an ideal teacher. How would you describe him or her? What does it take to be an ideal teacher? Okay, so I think ideal teacher is perception differs in uh -huh. people, right? So for me, I'm not the type of student who mm -hmm. needs like constant push and punishment. You know? mm -hmm. I don't need that. I just need a guide and instructor, which just shows me the right path. This way, for me, an ideal teacher is the one who gives me uh, good advice and who can direct me to the, towards the right direction. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And who actually takes into account like both my mental and physical well-being. Because mm -hmm. sometimes there will be days that you can show up and you won't be mentally stable to do the work, you know. And I think teachers should understand this. The students are also people. They are also like human beings. They are robots. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. And like not expecting anything like bigger from the students, you know, like capacity. There are some teachers like they say you should get this, you should get this score. For example, like constantly they remind their students to achieve something, mm -hmm. even though. They they never ask students whether he or she wants it or not, mm -hmm. right? So I think teachers should be involved in that students, not mm -hmm. only like academic life, but also personal. But I back to differ here a little. You said the teacher should not tell student uh, what they should achieve or should not achieve, but I think they should mm -hmm. because more often than not, students have no concept or they simply have no goals mm -hmm. and they don't know which direction they're headed towards what they know what they, and, and when you tell them that okay our goal is seven our goal is eight our goal is 8.5 you're giving them that sense of direction mm -hmm. which is missing and yes it should be done reasonably mm -hmm. it should be d done taking into account students capabilities and individual needs Right, capabilities mostly what they're capable of, right? But but again, as a teacher, I feel bad about ever saying to a student, you should aim for seven or you should aim for eight because they might actually capable of getting more, going further than that, right? So what I tell them instead is, depending on the, yes, partially depending on the on the program they are in, I tell them, okay, if you're PI, no, let's aim for eight. Let's aim for 8.5. I take into account their linguistic abilities as well, like their speech and their writing. I say, okay, you, 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 let's aim for eight. Let's, let's, don't be afraid to aim for an eight because they usually are. Mm -hmm. They're usually afraid. They, they, they just the thought of aiming for an eight gives them shivers. Mm -hmm. And as, as, as a teacher, I think it's your job to give them that permission to set that goal. I mean, you really want to use the word permission because they're waiting for that permission from their parents or you. Mm -hmm. Tell them that it's okay. Yes, you can do it. Yes, we can do it. Mm -hmm. So. But there are you know, words sometimes students come, their parents will be forcing them, mm -hmm. telling them constantly get an eight mm -hmm. with them though. You know, parents don't know English. Mm -hmm. They don't know their kids' level, right? Mm -hmm. But they tell their kids to get in. Mm -hmm. That was this kind of student in one of my groups. Mm -hmm. And but her level was six and a half, seven. And she used to come to my class, swollen eyes all the time, I'm crying after the class, saying, I can't like get what my parents are expecting from me. Because mm -hmm. come on, if we be realistic, if we have to be realistic, she she wasn't capable of getting in. Mm -hmm. You see? Within the time she had, right? Within the time Within within the deadline, no. she had, or she had unlimited deadline, unlimited. Time. No, it was limited deadline. She mm -hmm. couldn't get eight. 
Yeah, that's what I meant. Like within the time frame, she was allowed by her parents, right? Simply not may not be possible. And then so it felt miserable every day. Mm -hmm. And she had her health certain health condition. Mm -hmm. She used to cry all the time, right? Get nervous, and mm -hmm. we tried to talk to her parents multiple times. Yeah. Right. So I think sometimes we have to be really careful when we mm -hmm. say students to get that bad school because uh, sometimes it can happen with luck. Sometimes mm -hmm. students are lucky enough to get that school mm -hmm. to go off that school, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get difficult questions and even eight level students end up with 7.5. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have a lot of examples, like Ms. Nurjola from A12, right? Mm -hmm. Like she had zero point five short of eight overall. Mm -hmm. Wow. Exactly. We knew that she could get it, but mm -hmm. her, her, I think, listening was kind of challenging. Is she doing one school retake? She did. Oh, she already did? And she got half a point short of eight? Yeah. Okay. No, mm -hmm. she got the same score. Oh. Nothing changed. No, the same. It's a pity. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, 7.5, impressive. How old is she? She's 16, right? I think so, yes. She's a school student and yeah. she's so clever. She set her SAT. Uh -huh. Wow. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's we're so lucky to be working with these kids, bright, ambitious, individual. Their energy is so infectious. Yeah, right. right. We did quite a bit of talking about working here at, at Astra. Uh, what do you say we move on to your personal interests? Like, what do you see yourself? What do you find yourself doing when you're not teaching or other things or having podcasts like this? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you watch podcasts? I do, like mostly in English. Mm -hmm. I watch, I mainly watch movies actually. I sometimes mm -hmm. listen to music and I mostly watch podcasts about random topics. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have any favorites. I watch random podcasts that appears on my fan page. All right, then let me ask you this. Uh, what's one must watch podcast for you? Or what's one recommendation you would have for the audience here? you have for, for our audience, worth a watch. Okay, I'm not gonna tell exact one podcast, mm -hmm. but I have a girl mm -hmm. on YouTube that I follow, follow for, mm -hmm. for, I don't even know how long. Like, I really, really like her channel, and when I started learning English, I started imitating her, mm -hmm. that I, and her name is Kennedy Walsh. Mm -hmm. And she, her sister and her brother, they have podcasts right now. Mm -hmm. And those podcasts are not about education. Mm -hmm. They are about like real life things, mm -hmm. you know, about everything but education. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like listening to their podcasts. It's just uh, siblings sitting down and just rambling about different things, mm -hmm. no pressure, yeah. all chill vibes, mm -hmm. like this podcast here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, would you say this podcast gives the same vibes? Of course. Or it depends on the guest, right? The guest or host? Uh, uh, mostly the guest. Mostly the guest. Like the, if you ask the guest behind the scenes right now, mm -hmm. he, he can instantly tell this podcast has different vibes, right? It's more fun, jovial, and lively, right? But with other podcasts I had in the past, some are, some of them are so thought-provoking and, and dense and rich. And some of them are slow, some of them fast. Yeah. Sometimes we get into the debates, but I don't see that happening here. We're just sitting down and chatting like those siblings you follow on YouTube. Right? Cool, 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 cool. Right. You said you don't like watching movies, right? Mm -hmm. no. uh, you don't like them a lot? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can totally skip that part. What, one thing I know for sure about this lady is, though, she is a music lover. Mm -hmm. She's one hell of a music lover, right? You love music, don't you? I right. Know. Who's your Who's your favorite singer? Who do you listen to? Okay, so let me break it. I really have favorite singer. Uh -huh. I listen to the song, mm -hmm. paying attention to the lyrics, uh -huh. the meaning, uh -huh. and the beat, of course. Uh -huh. I mostly listen to Russian songs. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Sure. And then in English, I was into Orlando Del Rey. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, she's a pop queen, right? What, what's your favorite song of hers? Um, Summertime Sadness. Mm -hmm. 
said this West Coast, mm -hmm. Mountain Dew. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. All massive pieces. Yeah. All right. And then I do sometimes listen to um, there is one there is one song mm -hmm. called Streets mm -hmm. by Belgian Cat. I'm not a fan of her. Yeah. I don't really like observe or watch her or follow her, but this song, the beat is insane. Irresistible. It, it, it's so irresistible, right? Just keeps sometimes plays in my head too. Yeah. I just because I I remember hearing it once on your phone. It's your ringtone. It used to be. Is it still your ringtone? No, it's not. It used to be your ringtone. I heard it once and I was instantly hooked. And I had to go and look it up. I literally asked you once what it was and you shared it with me, right? Yeah. Right, right. I like that. I heard this on mm -hmm. Instagram and instantly I I didn't even know that mm -hmm. the singer was Dodger Cat. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And what's wrong with the singer being Dodger Cat? No, I mean, I don't normally mm -hmm. um, listen to, you know, American singer's songs. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Mean, Right. Well, why, why not? Why are you not a fan of that? I love forcing. Yeah. I love forcing. I don't like that. Well, that's that's usually the case with hip hop, right? But if you listen to pop music, I guess they don't have that much. I listen to pop and mm. there's not that much. For example, and I also listen to Arabic songs, mm. even though I don't understand that's anything there. Right. Yes. yes. And Turkish songs, they don't curse there. I mean, mm. not the ones that I listen to. Yeah. So. I know something that can make this podcast really exclusive right now. Yeah, and yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah. I, she knows what I'm about to ask her. That would be a big favor if you could sing your favorite song here. Just a, just a couple of lines. No, I can't. I can. I can just tell like boy, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I can. I can sing. Are you sure though? We can make a deal here. If you sing your favorite song, I'm going to sing mine. That's a good deal. After your podcast, probably. But oh, why not on the podcast? I mean, that's what the, that's what all the fun. Come on, look at my voice. Yeah. I sound like a guys. Pot, uh, song, sing, 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 sing. We want her to sing. Please, I can. All right. Just, just a, just a snippet. You can go on. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> All right, sure. She doesn't want it. I will. Right. You ever read books? You do? Yeah. So you want to tell us book, your favorite book about your favorite books or the book you're reading right now? Sure. So you know what? When I was in school, I used to read a lot. And at the time, I used to read English books. Mm -hmm. And you know what, the genre that I like is a little bit uncommon about girls, mm -hmm. which is horror. I enjoy horror stuff. I enjoy paranormal activity. So I'm a big fan of Stephen King. You remind me of one of your students, PI12, Miss Anast Anastasia. Now, I didn't know Miss Vizier also read horror stuff. She's, she's so quiet. She's eerily quiet. Yeah. So the life you like student. Yeah, <laughs> it, it creeps me out. Wow, what is it about horror stories you guys love so much? Jump scare. Uh -huh. Right. Yes. Uh, you know what? When you watch drama, when you mm -hmm. watch tragedy, comedy, you know what's coming, right? Mm -hmm. When you watch horror stuff, mm -hmm. you don't know what's You never know. Mm -hmm. Like, there are a lot of jump scares mm -hmm. and plot twists and... You really have to pay, like, focus, you know, you really have to pay attention to what's mm -hmm. going on there because mm -hmm. the moment that you start being dreamy, you can't understand mm -hmm. what is the movie about, you mm -hmm. know. So that's what just keeps me attracted. Mm -hmm. And since my childhood, I all the time is to watch, sometimes I watch uh, horror movies. As I said, I don't like watching movies, but I do watch horror stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I can recommend a few. Conjuring, The Nun, Annabelle. Please don't watch those movies. Please, please don't ever watch those. <laughs> this lady is out of her mind. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Do not watch horror unless you want to have terrible nightmares at, at night and wet your bed. <laughs> you know what? When I recommended those movies, actually 80% of your audience have already watched it. 
I need to do that. Because all of my students started saying, hey, teacher, they have that good skin. Like, I can't tell you what was on the chair. I was like, wow. <laughs> Those kids grow up so fast. Yes. Yeah. They watch everything these days. I know. Because right. they are exposed mm -hmm. to the internet and everything is mm -hmm. free there. Mm -hmm. They can just navigate through all the websites wherever they want. Mm -hmm. And it's due to the early exposure. You know, if the way your old child knows how to use YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like, so I, I don't even remember what was age we were when I was three. Mm -hmm. Probably just doing nothing and sleeping. Mm -hmm. But today's kids, they know how to use yeah. technology. Yeah, we we here we we we're old fashioned. We grew under the rock, grew up under the rock. Now, yeah, we're not. But th those kids, though, when they grow up, I just I just wonder what they're gonna be like. I think they're gonna be fed up mm -hmm. with films. I remember the first time, for the first time when I got my phone, mm -hmm. I was ten, so when I was grade, mm -hmm. and I used to, you know, like use it every single day trying to figure out what kind of things there are and what can I do by film like a smartphone. And after a while, I don't even touch my phone. Mm -hmm. I stopped even touching it because I know what's there. I only like answer phone calls and I use it when I need it. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is gonna happen with them. It would have failed. So they they're gonna develop what's called this tech technology fatigue. Yes. They're gonna be fatigued, right? Right. So it's as if we have this inbuilt anti-technology mechanism or just this innate desire that pulls us back to nature, to natural surroundings and take it, take a break from technology every now and then, right? But what if that inbuilt feature gets replaced over time by our addiction to technology? It's very much possible that at some point in the future, technology and humans are going to merge. Like, technology will become our digital extension. This is literally happening. You, with those Neuralink, Neuralink chips, you must have seen it somewhere or heard about it. Elon Musk is developing, his company is developing this chip that allows human technology integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after that, it's 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 all gonna be movie Terminator, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, have, you guys ever seen the movie Terminator? One, yeah, Terminator. You you never watched it? Probably. If you tell me the plot, I may yeah. know it. I don't know the names. This lady is so uh, movie culture illiterate. <laughs> You're missing out a lot. You're, yeah, yeah. And now you can tell that I don't like watching films. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You ever watch the movies I shared with you? Of course. What do you mean? Yeah. I always have wrote my comments there. Yeah. My thoughts. What, what do I think? How did you like the last movie I shared with you? It's, it was called The Chef, starring Robert Downey Jr., right? Or it was a different movie? You know, I think he shared it when he was in the hospital. Yeah. No, I think I didn't watch it. Oh. But I remember watching the previous one, mm -hmm. Anything I'm Missing. Mm -hmm. Oh, you like that? It's about a lady who's got a condition and she can't go outside. But in the end, it was all like, what her mom, mm -hmm. like, made up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she didn't even have anything. It was just her mom's fear mm -hmm. of losing her mm -hmm. because she lost her husband and child in a car accident and she didn't want to lose a daughter. Mm -hmm. But that, that's why she created this thing in her mind and made her daughter believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah, right, right. You said you were at the hospital, right? Would you be comfortable talking about your condition? I know, I know this is not something you might be entirely comfortable talk, speaking about. It might bring back some painful memories. But as I said earlier today on the podcast, this is going to be more or less like a biopic, biography, movie, biography podcast. So, and, and that, and that your condition makes up a big part of your life. You've gone through a lot. So do you want to, you want to talk about that as well? Do you want to, are you comfortable getting into that sure. chapter? Right. So when, when did your condition start? And, and you want to, you might want to also tell our audience what your condition is. 
So I have this sort of health condition like cancer. It's bone cancer called um, sarcoma or chondrosarcoma. And I think I had this ever since I was fifth or sixth grade. Mm-hmm. I had the pain, I knew that it was there. There was something, but I never like told it to anyone. Mm-hmm. Because I thought like it was like, as I said, I used to be athletic, mm-hmm. I used to do sports, and every now and then it's it's very common to get like traumas when you you know like go for sports, like you do sports. That's why I thought it was one of them. But it was definitely not, I didn't get this trauma from sport. It's not something that you get. It. And then the pain got even worse. Like a year later, like I couldn't even, like I wasn't even able to move my hands. And then I thought, okay, it's something serious. And we went to the doctor and the doctor said, like, it's not a big deal. You can just, you know, like um, really the pain when you use these, these, these like medical things he gave me prescription. And then I bought all the drugs, all the pills, and it was temporarily the pain stopped. But after a while, it again started. But again, I didn't tell it to anyone. And then my doctor recommended me to give up sports, not doing sports. I was around the seventh grade at that time. And I did it. So one day I remember the very first reason that made me go to the doctor after a year was I hit my shoulder when I was on the bus. That's why I hate commuting my buses because there are a lot of people and they can exhale and touch my hands, which actually causes a lot of pain. So at that time, like I couldn't bear the pain and I went home and told my mom that we have to go to the doctor. So the next day we went there and the doctor um, like diagnosed me with cancer and my mom didn't believe it because I was never like ill, you know, since my childhood. That's why it was like hard to believe. And then we went to another doctor. They said like we need this scan, you know, like uh, you need to go to medical checkup. They have to confirm it. And pretty much we like went to all professional doctors in the car and touch him, and all of them said the same thing. Even the scans, like those uh, like medical documentations, everything showed the same thing, which means I had cancer at that time. And they wanted to take a biopsy from it. Biopsy is a mini operation, uh, which is taken to check your cancer like cell layer, whether it's malignant or benign. If it's malignant, no cure at all, because it's gonna spread all over your body, which they call metastasis. It's gonna spread all over your body. It's impossible to cure. And there's another type called benign. It's like in Russian, it's gonna be the thing. And if you have this, it means like it's it's not that harmful, but not dangerous. The cancer cell is gonna stay here. It's gonna be set on like a thin white capsule. But spreading is not possible, and it's benign. So they checked mine, and turns out it was malignant. And I remember, like, everybody was freaked out, and everyone was making a big deal out of it. Honestly, I didn't understand. I was like a 15 or 14 year old girl at that time, and I was like, why aren't they making a big deal out of it? Okay, if I have to sleep in condition, I'm gonna go to the hospital. and like get better. And I I knew, I knew that it was not something normal because of the pain. So my mom came to me saying, hey, we need to like stay here in the hospital because your condition is not like something um, that, you know, like passes by that just goes away. And I said, okay, for sure. And my doctors recommended um, chemotherapy. At the time I had heard about chemotherapy, but I never, I didn't know how it worked. And I was like, mom, why are you making a big deal out of it? Because she was asking for other alternatives. I literally remember my mom's having a doctor's conversation at the time. My mom was looking for other options and other alternatives, except for that chemotherapy. And my doctor said, unfortunately, there was no. At that time, I really, really hate the fact that I didn't ask or other alternatives from other doctors, you know, because 
you know what? Um, oncology right now has turned into a big business. So the hospital, when you go there, like the chances of you being diagnosed with cancer is, is like real, you know? The chances are like 30% or 40%, even though you don't have cancer. There are a lot of patients, you know, getting chemotherapy, radiation there, even though they didn't have cancer, you know? They do it just because you have to buy those drugs, you know? And I remember telling my mom, mom, okay, that's fine. I'm going to take it. And I know that I'm not supposed to tell this right now, but like according to the rules, actually, if you are a patient of oncology, you have to get those drugs for free. It's provided by the state. But we used to buy it. Like it used at that time, back in 2020, it used to cost like $200, $300. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm not from a rich background. My mom was single and I didn't work at that time. So it was kind of like difficult for us. So I was like, okay, mom, we are giving it a try. And then my doctor started telling me like what happens if I get chemotherapy. And the very first thing that happens is you lean into your hair, but it rolls your eyebrows, eyelashes, everything, every like all the hair, hairy parts. And then the next thing happens is your, your appetite is going to be blocked. You won't be able to eat anything. Well, let me make it clear. It's not going to happen with everyone because like I am like naturally sensitive to meals. I can't eat the whole universe. I'm very picky. So even though I catch food, the very first thing that happens to me is my appetite gets blocked. So the same happened when I got my chemo. Some people are able to eat, while others, they can't. So I was one of those people who couldn't, you know? And I remember getting my first chemo and within five days, I lost my hair. And I remember the day. So I was losing my hair and I know that my mom was there and I had no right, you know, like to, to, you know, like get depressed or to be, to have emotional breakdown at that time. And my mother came and he said, like, how are you doing? And I was like, you know what? We have to shave my hair. We have to shave my hat. And then he did it. And I literally saw the tears in his eyes. And he said, hey, she can I go out? Because I need to like check out my granddad. I knew that my granddad was totally okay. He just went out and just, you know, like not showing me that he was crying. And then um, I got my first chemo and within like a week, I remember I wasn't able to eat anything. And that's why they give you a lot of hormones and everything so that you don't get hungry, right? And yeah, they are gonna give, they used to give me 21 days break and a week for my chemo because chemo is going to make your veins really weak and it's going to be really difficult for doctors you know, to put the injection in because they are so thin and it's kind of like impossible. So yeah, that's how I got my first chemotherapy. And then I went for another one and another one. So I had all like seven chemos. When was the last time you had a chemotherapy? When was your last chemotherapy? I think it was back in 2021, um, June, July, July, it is July. Right. And you haven't had any since then, right? So how's your recovery going? You're doing good? It's still there. Yeah. It's still there. I mean, I don't want to go back to that place ever again. We know, like, the atmosphere allowed me to be. They are alive for you today. I mean, you look at people, they are alive, physically alive, but emotionally, they are already dead. Like, you know what? Obviously, you're not going to be... You're talking about patients there, right? Oncology center. Yes. At the hospital. Yeah. They are already emotionally dead. Mm. They don't have this you know, drive to live. 
And the, the very first thing that I thought, let's, let's change it, that I was afraid of was becoming one of them. And I indeed became one of them. Yes, because like I spent a lot of time there, you know, days, months, years, and obviously I like they turned they actually you now like attracted me. That negative energy energy just you now like ate me alive there. Like I remember like praying for God, like happened actually something to happen to the hospital so that I don't have to go there quarantine or lockdown or something because it was that miserable a normal person like a healthy united person doesn't want to be among this kind of people you yeah? know they don't really want to live and they don't actually like let others have positive mindset you know they want to change your mindset like instantly you think maybe it's not really about their, you know, it's, it's not really about their personality, but more has to do with how those chemicals and drugs change their brain chemistry. Come on. I was also taking it. Mm-hmm. And I, I was not like, you know, reacting to mm-hmm. things like the way they do. And plus, I was the youngest patient there. Mm-hmm. There was no one younger than me. Like all of those ladies were like all they were like as, as the ages like my as the same age as my grandma my mom like they were old people you know adults and the thing that they were not like they were not capable of controlling themselves their thoughts their reactions just you know like made me question everything and that that was the main reason I was afraid of becoming one of them mm-hmm. being that negative. And pulling everyone like down. Mm-hmm. Last we talked about your condition, you told me there is some good news, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to share that news as well? Just yes. this, you're telling me now there is treatment option possible in India. Mm-hmm. When when are you doing that? Because as I said, um, the cancer cell, the location, mm-hmm. like it's it's kind of like. Difficult to break, mm-hmm. even for the professionals. Mm-hmm. That, I know I don't know what that's what my doctor said. So, mm-hmm. um, if there is a slight mistake, then I may not be able to move my hands. I'll be disabled mm-hmm. forever. So I can't take this risk. Mm-hmm. Like if I can't move my hands, then I have to, you know, rely on someone to do some things like things for me. Like I have to rely on someone which I don't really want mm-hmm. in this life. So I don't want to take that risk. So right now I'm on flying. Right. Yeah. You see, this is actually one of the things I really admire about you is the fact that you've been practically through hell and you're still standing on your feet. And that takes a lot of resilience. Just, you know, at the beginning of the podcast today, I said I was going to talk to a guest who was initially one of the inspirations behind this podcast. And I wasn't lying when I said that because on the reasons why I went on to get my second nine or the other reason why I started this podcast, all the other things I'm doing, is because at the other, at the at the back of my head, sometimes, not sometimes, quite often, I think about you, the fact that you show up every single day, despite all you've been through. And if I, with all the opportunities I've been given, and perfect health, am not showing up every day and doing my best. I just, I don't deserve this life. I just, because I, I feel so ashamed. I, I feel ashamed before you. I feel ashamed before so many other people your age who, who might be going through the same problem. And it's, it's good motivation. It, it is a good motivation. Right? And I don't ever get to complain about anything. I don't have, have a chance. I don't, I really can't. When there are 
people out there who are heroes, heroines like you, who are who have been through a lot in life and in constant pain and has had a lot of trauma and they still show up every day with a smile on their face and keep sharing po- the, all this positivity and and helping their community. They are the real heroes. Sometimes so. if we want to give up, you know, you can. Because, you know what, I have to say that it's all because of my mom. If it wasn't about her, I would have already given up. Yeah? Like, I remember telling my mom that, let's stop it, mom. I'm not getting any better. So you know deep down. You know deep down that you are not getting any better. But you look at your mom's eyes, you see the spark. And you can't say, you can't demotivate her. And for her own sake, for her sake, you, you have to continue that. You know? Even though you are like, you know, like going through this misery or like having, like you are going through a lot of pain, you have no right to stop because like a person like her, she's just you now like looking at me with this hope in her eyes that one day I'll just get better and, you know, live life like a normal human being. You still can. You still can. You just gotta keep fighting. Yes. But sometimes you just get tired of fighting as well. Sometimes you just really want to have this moment. Like, we really need to be realistic, you know? Sometimes, yes, you should have hope when you trust that you're going somewhere, you're getting somewhere, right? But when you know for a fact that Nothing. You're gonna get nothing from it. You're going nowhere. What's the point of like holding for something to change? You know, instead, instead, that's why I started focusing on other things. You know, this one. At first, I'm not gonna lie, I was questioning my entire existence. I had tons of unanswered questions saying why me, or exactly me, why others are living like me only. But then I turned around and looked around myself. Everyone was dealing with something. And still everyone was dealing with something. No one is perfect. I mean, the problems that I have, there's a thing you also have problems, right? Of course, we can't compare people's problems, but even though, like, some people have big problems, some people have, like, no problems, at least they are dealing with something. No one's life is perfect. And that actually motivated me to live the life. Yes. That right there is why I do what I do. Oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Remember when I found out about your condition when I had just met you Mm -hmm. after our interview? I was, I was caught up in a mentally dark place because I just kept thinking about you. And it happened for months. I was solely, like the big part of my mental space, I was all taken by the thought of you having that condition. And I just, I just couldn't help think to myself, like, how, how? And is there anything I can do? And, and, and what's worse is this entire time you're thinking, you know there's not much you can do. And this feeling of powerlessness just started eating away at me. You know how many times you've worked away and you're really not to give up? In all those moments, though, I was, I was so mentally beat up. But anyway, I, I had to put on... Put on it. Put on a positive face, encouraging face, and tell you to keep fighting. Do you remember the time when, like, you texted, you texted me at the, like at night? It was after the class, saying, "Hey, you all right?" Because I said I was going, mm-hmm. like, to take my medication. This was literally the day where I wanted to give up the course. Yes, and I was like, I think I can't take it. Like. 
I was like, I have to stop it because otherwise mm-hmm. I'm going to be burdened for people here because mm-hmm. I can't show up every day and all just thoughts, you know. And on that day, I didn't even tell him that I wanted to give up. And he said, no matter what, you should show up to everything. And that was something really strong and powerful here. He said, never feel alone. But there was something like that. And it just, you know, like motivated me to come, to show up the next day and continue my studies. Because I was mentally there fighting with you. I was mentally there fighting with you. Not long ago, actually, when I checked on you about your condition, I I sort of got reminded of my mission because every now and then I lose touch with my mission. And ever since I met you and had that talk with you, that you had become my life's mission. I've, I've never said this before, but I, I want to grow so powerful that one day I don't feel that powerless anymore. You think the day comes? I don't really care. I'm just going to keep trying. You know what? Sometimes things that she never expected and that she think you don't deserve happens, right? The same things happen. And what I, you know, what I came to realize is you should just stop questioning and saying, why is it all happening with me, all this bad person? And more. I, I never think, I don't think about that anymore. I used to think about that. See? I don't think about that anymore because uh, all, all I'm thinking about right now is just winning that fight. That's been my, that's my only priority. And that takes me fighting every minute of my life. And if that's what it takes, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, and that's all I ask of you too. Just keep fighting because I just want you to know that I'm fighting too. We're, we're in this together. We're in this together. You're never going to be alone. Uh, we're about to wrap it up. The, this is the final part of the podcast. And we usually, I usually end the podcast on a more philosophical note, right? Uh, there are some questions I want to ask you before we call the day. Now, uh, would you like to describe your philosophy, personal philosophy? Well, how would you describe your personal philosophy in just a few lines or a few words? Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? So what's something that guides you in life? What's the, uh, what's the, your motto? Mm-hmm. So, okay. Um, as I said, my mom mm-hmm. is my hero. Okay. She's my idol. So she has like given me that like amazing and Mm -hmm. like beautiful life Mm -hmm. and everything that I'm doing right now is to repay you know everything she has done for me I want to show like better life I want to give the best of everything to her Mm -hmm. and that's my motto and that's my drive every time when I feel like quitting I think about it and I instantly start working just as we're having this podcast right now, she's waiting outside in the lobby. Yes. She came to pick you up. Yep. Right. Great mom. So admirable. All right. So what's one piece of advice you would love to give your younger self if you could travel back in time? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I would say don't be afraid of anything. Mm-hmm. Whatever happens, happens for a reason. Just mm-hmm. like move on like whatever happens like there is a light at the end of every tunnel so Mm -hmm. if you are having a bad day this is just a few chapters of your story it's not the entire it's not what the entire story is about right Mm -hmm. it's normal it's totally okay to have some bad days and to feel like doing nothing but deep down you should know that you're doing fine you're doing perfect and you're gonna ace it i would say that right 
Yeah, just keep going, right? Yeah, whatever you do, you do. there is always your mom behind you, so uh-huh. don't be scared. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. There's nothing to be afraid of when you got your mom mom in your corner. Right? Yes. Moms are great. Right. And let's say this podcast is now being watched by your future self. Mm-hmm. What's something you would want to say to your future self? So I know that you can get everything. Uh-huh if not more, oh. that you wanted. So um, if you're watching this future, Shekhinia, mm-hmm. um, know that right now I, you are my idol and mm-hmm. I'm working on myself to mm-hmm. be a woman like you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's it. Right. I'm sure your future self is not right now looking back. and You, you want to wave at her. Hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Ms. Shahina, it was such a pleasure talking to you today and reflecting on our past and the journey we've been on and the, and the stories we, we've made together and the experiences we've had. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and sharing all this with me, with our audience. I, yeah, I thank you a lot. Thanks for having me as well. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'd love to have you on the podcast more sequel guys i hope i'm I'm sure you want to see the sequel one day right yeah once i get nine (laughs) yeah yep why not Uh, yeah why not well for sure all right guys if you enjoyed today's episode don't forget to subscribe and like this content and leave your comments in the comment section below i'll catch you in the next one peace